Brooke is hiding something, perhaps even multiple somethings. The thing is, I don't even think he realizes it because he's too busy panty watching and yo-ho-hoing, kind of like a really lecherous Santa Claus. But Brooke is a ticking time bomb of knowledge just waiting to be dropped on all of us. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. My name is Liam and personally, I'm not a huge fan of having things dropped on me, but today I will make an exception because Brooke is a very deceptive topic. At face value, he's a rather light-hearted presence who exists for fun and mild showings of combat. Also at face value, he has no face, yo <laughs> etc. But there is an aspect of Brooke's life that Oda has hinted at, but quite deliberately never expanded upon. And this has to do with his kingdom of origin, the consumption of his devil fruit, and the fact that he may very well have unknowingly met one of the most important figures in this world. All of which occurred prior to his time with the Rambar Pirates. And as for a man who's existence predates almost every other living character in the series, he definitely knows a lot more than he's letting on. Just like Joseph McDonald, Snugs McDuff, and Ben McSalty, all three of whom know many things because they press the subscribe button for the Grand Line Review, which results in consistent injections of One Piece culture being administered directly into your YouTube feed. And if you want to be our next subscriber of the day, then hit the button and please do say hi in the comments below. If you are a new member of the Grand Fleet, welcome. All right, let's open the book of Brooke. We all understand Brooke's broad history, or at least the part that Oda wants us to focus on. This is the history involving music, whales, and rather large zombie men, who in retrospect look like an upside down radish. But Brooke had an entire life before this, and I guess he also had an entire life after this. If nothing else, this man knows how to live. But this very sneaky history was inserted into One Piece with the skills of a Hokage level ninja. In chapter 489, when properly introducing himself to the Straw Hats after they beat Gecko Radish, Brooke Brooke proclaims that, quote, long ago, I was the leader of a battle convoy in a certain kingdom. After that, I served with the Rumbar Pirates as the musician swordsman and later stepped in as captain. He gives no reason for why he became a pirate in the first place, which yes, is rather curious. But prior to this, Brooke actually held an incredibly high status within the certain kingdom. And by the way, we are near certain about what this kingdom was. It's been mentioned in the series before with some tantalizing Brooke linkage. However, before that, let's all take a moment to dwell on how casually this information was not only dropped, but also very swiftly forgotten. In the context of One Piece as we know it, it's practically irrelevant because it doesn't contribute in any way to the story of Brooke as we understand it. Which means that this is either Oda indulging in miscellaneous details or more likely the Brooke story, very counterintuitively for a dead man I might add, is actually far from over. Because many of the Straw Hats have had something of a narrative renaissance during the New World Era. The most obvious example would be Sanji on Whole Cake Island with a whole second flashback for that greedy, greedy chef. But Wano has also seen some expansion on Zora's past as well. And the thing is that Brooke is a very unique Straw Hat because he joined the crew and then was immediately separated from them. Apart from his initial story with the Boon and the Rambar Pirates, he hardly received any exploration before he vanished. He was actually so irrelevant that the world didn't even realize he was a member of the Straw Hat Pirates, which is why, rather unfortunately, there was no budget Brooke within the fake Straw Hat crew. Brooke joining the crew, just like your parents walking in on you enjoying a, a private moment, was very awkwardly timed. And of every Straw Hat, he is the one due for an expansion. And Oda is well aware of that, because this clumsy author keeps dropping his Brook hints all over the place. Hints that I now need to clean up like some sort of glorified internet custodian. Which brings us to the Certain Kingdom. You've heard its name, but you probably don't remember it. In chapter 501, during the initial Sabadi arc, we are introduced to a slave named Byron at the human auction house. And Disco, the complete and utter bungle nut of an auctioneer, says the following about him. He's from a long line of musicians and can play all kinds of instruments. He's also a pirate. Give him an instrument and he'll play. Give him a mop and he'll clean. Which, if you take the name Byron away, pretty much just sounds like Brooke. Give him an instrument and he'll play. Give him a mop and he'll clean. Give him a woman and he will ask for panties. That's probably what Disco was about to say, that being a panty fiend probably would have driven Byron's price way, way, way down. But Disco also states that Byron is from the Taroa Kingdom in West Blue, which happens to be the blue where Brooke's certain kingdom was located. Coincidence, I think. Maybe. But in summary, we have a pirate from a lineage of trained musicians who dresses exactly like the Rumba Pirates did, who also happens to be from the same part of the world as them. Now, in reality, this is what we would call a fun coincidence. However, in narrative, this is what we would call intentional. Because when you're writing a story, the thought will cross an author's mind that perhaps they maybe shouldn't create two completely separate musician-based societies who dress alike and are from the same place in the world. Because that kind of thing might leave readers confused, so it's better just to keep things at one. 
Now I should say that I was actually introduced to this idea by another YouTuber named Dawn of the World, who even offered up a truly astounding chunklet of evidence, which is the color spread of chapter 503. This spread features Brooke playing delightful musics with these here happy leaf hoppers. And one particular genus of leaf hopper happened to be called Taroa. And on this color spread, you can even see that one of the potential Taroa is even wearing Brooke's glasses. Now I am willing to accept that this is but a crazy coincidence. However, it is fascinating that this happens in the color spread for 500 when the Taroa Kingdom was mentioned mere chapters earlier in 501. Again, I'm happy to call this a bizarre coincidence because I really don't like reading too much into color spread theories. For example, does anyone remember the zombie Zoro theory? There was a color spread called Picnic with Zombies and Zoro was sitting on a gravestone that had the number 944 on it. <laughs> so people were all like, oh my God, Zoro is going to die in chapter 944. The foreshadowing is right there. In fact, there are two fours and four means death. Double the death, Zoro's gonna die twice. And I laughed at them, but you know what? They they sure showed me. So rest in peace, green sword man. I also want to flag that reading too far into fashion can also be a bit of a tricky proposition, particularly with wealth and aristocracy, because Oda has a similar fallback design across the series. I mean, for example, if you gave Sabo a violin, he'd probably look like he was from the same kingdom as Brooke as well. So take that factor for what you will. But the timing of all of these features is curious, especially since Brooke was still a very fresh element considering the Sabadi arc came immediately after Brooke's flashback on Thriller Bark. And knowing that he was about to be taken away, I can absolutely see Oda trying to cram in some extra future Brooke foundation while he still had the chance. And while we're on that subject, Brooke is much more prominent in Oda's mind than many of us may think. A sassy skeleton was planned to be a straw hat from day one, and Laboon's story was pretty much set in stone. Plus, Luffy had been gunning for a musician before his crew even had a cook, a navigator, a swordsman, or a long nose. In fact, all during East Blue, Luffy would bang on and on and on about recruiting a musician to the point where I was like, dude, chill. I, I like music as well, but we need to not starve right now. So Brooke is very prominent in the mind of Oda and he's a lot more than a bit of comic relief with a tragic backstory, especially considering the time in which he lived his life, which is an era completely unknown to us right now because it was before the likes of Rocks, Garps, and even Goldie Rogers. And this is where things get very exciting. When meeting Silver's Rayleigh and hearing Roger's name with his no ears, Brooke muses to himself, I think there was a rookie by the name of Gold Roger, or maybe not, which is a weird statement to make for many reasons. Firstly, when he was a rookie, Roger would have gone by the name Gold D. Roger because gold is what people started calling him much, much later in life. Funny though, because technically Brooke was the Pirate King Senpai. Brooke was born 13 years prior to Roger and he met his first death at the age of 38. So at most, Roger would have been 25 by the time that Brooke got separated from this world. Assumedly, well and truly still in his rookie phase. Which makes me wonder if Brooke may have actually met Roger and just kind of forgotten about it because he would have just been a young upstart like many other pirates. Especially because it would have been unlikely for Roger's name to have spread too far and too famously way back in these times. Sort of like a Frankie style situation where he did meet the Roger pirates, but just doesn't seem to quite realize it. At the very least, if we do get a much earlier Roger flashback, I would fully expect Oda to slide Brooke on in there, even if he's just reacting to a news article or something. But Brooke has a very unique perspective on the world because again, he was an active pirate until the age of 38, which is only one year less than Shanks has currently lived. So that's more than enough time to explore a whole ton of this world and learn some very intriguing secrets. But Brooke never talks about his past, probably because he doesn't see it as relevant. But there is an absolute nugget of gold lying in that skelly brain somewhere. For example, God Valley very much still existed when Brooke was alive, and perhaps he knows vaguely how to get there if and when that becomes relevant. There are so many potential questions that could just be answered by something like, oh yeah, I was there 70 years ago. Here's, here's the secret. But the one question we will definitely answer is why Brooke left his position as a battle convoy leader in order to become a pirate. There is a deep history here just waiting to be explored. The kind that really hasn't been flagged with any other straw hat. Well, Sanji aside, but, but we know his history now. Something happened within this kingdom though, which caused the Rumbar pirates to form because at least half of them are implied to be from the same origin as Brook. Although very notably, the Rumbar pirates kind of have a dual fashion style happening. Half of them look like these pompous musicians and the other half are rugged, dirt encrusted cowboys. Dawn of the World even suggested that there was a war between two 
Kingdoms and the Rumba Pirates were formed by factions of both of them. And then there's the Devil Fruit, Brook's Yomi Yomi no Mi, a fruit whose powers were clearly understood by both Brook and the Rumba Pirates, which is intriguing because there is no way of knowing that from the effect of the fruit alone. Because it doesn't turn Brook into a giraffe, a big pile of fire, or even a delightful bubble bath like most Devil Fruits do. Meaning that Brook more than likely knew what this fruit was capable of before he ate it. And that he, or the feeder, I guess we'll call them, had access to a Devil Fruit encyclopedia. Which is not an easy thing to come across. In fact, right now we've only really seen them in the hands of the hyper wealthy. Because remember, most of the world still believe that Devil Fruits are myths and do not exist at all. So this encyclopedia isn't exactly commonly distributed. But what drives a man to eat fruit? Specifically, this fruit, this, this second life fruit. Because to be honest, I'm not entirely sure if I would. The fruit practically ensures that you will outlive everyone you know and love. So I don't think it's something you consume because you just want some fun powers to play with. It's more like something you eat out of responsibility for some greater cause, which to be fair is what Brook is using it for right now. He, on behalf of the Rumba Pirates, needs to find Laboon and play him their final sing song. That's not why he originally ate the fruit though, so there's, there's definite stuff to be explored here. Like the fact that Brook is 88 years old at the time of his introduction. Far from a randomly chosen number, because the amount of keys on a standard piano just so happens to be 88. Which I only point out because it shows that sometimes Oda can be quite painfully detailed. So at times it can be a bit difficult to know what you should be reading into and what you definitely shouldn't. But at the very least, Brook doesn't have any problems with reading because he has no eyes. Yo! <laughs> Although actually I would argue that that would be like a, a pretty big problem for reading. So let's do none of that and watch this next video instead, because there's always more to learn, explore, and experience with this wonderful series, so I look forward to seeing you there.